to what other 40,000 conspiracy theories. <laughs> 40k more than anything Games Workshop has produced lends itself particularly well to fan conspiracy theories, simply because so much of the background of 40k is either unknown or contradictory. Uh, Games Workshop seem to give their authors carte blanche to just contradict themselves, make up whatever they want uh, about the background of 40k, with the excuse of course being that it's up to us as the readers to determine what we deem to be true. Uh, Perhaps nothing better exemplifies Games Workshop's somewhat laissez-faire approach to retconning and continuity of the background than the Auto Chronos, which is an excellent explanation as to why the dates in Warhammer 40k are somewhat confusing, as they've been fighting a temporal civil war for millennia over the correct date. And in fact, they've made it heresy within the 40k universe to know what the date is. Uh, perhaps the best way to uh, go about ensuring what the correct date is, it would seem, is using the vagaries of the warp and time travel to go back and eliminate from history anybody who disagrees with you as to what the date was. Uh, this, I think, is perhaps one of my favourite Games Workshop conspiracy theories based on a throwaway comment in the background. Everyone knows, of course, that the Ordo Kronos does not exist. It's been conclusively disproven by the rest of the Inquisition. Uh, so let's just move on. Uh, I'm going to take this off because it's quite hot. I'm going to risk the mind control rays taking over. Uh, I have reached out to the community asking for some of their favourite conspiracy theories. And in this video, we're going to go through them, chat a little bit about what they mean within the context of one 40,000 background. Uh, let me know in the comments below your favourite 40k conspiracy theories and your views on anything that I bring up in this video. Okay, here we go. So, conspiracy theory number one. Uh, this one references the gods of chaos and the demon primarchs, and it's this. Lorgar isn't meditating in his own personal cathedral. In fact, Erebus and Corferon have him bound inside so that the two of them can rule without him screwing things up for them. And of course, if anyone could bind a demon Primarch, it's those two. Well, Erebus, of course, has been uh, one of the all-time banes of Warhammer 40,000 background, so it is fully within my belief that he could have uh, concocted some kind of scheme to trap his Primarch in some kind of Cathedral Sepulchre and him and Corfair on between the two of them then just battle it out till last one standing gets to rule the galaxy. Uh, however, my personal explanation for why uh, Lorgar is still in seclusion is uh, it's explained in one of the 40k Horus Heresy background novels uh, that Corvus Corax came looking for him in kind of a, a warp-based form, essentially a murderous flock of ravens that could uh, take on uh, corporeal form again, but uh, being a, a slightly, uh, I suppose, imperial demon prince version of a Primarch, and uh, he basically hunted Lorgar across the warp until Lorgar locked himself inside like a teenage girl in a slasher movie, uh, with Corax perched outside, essentially telling Lorgar that the moment he sets foot outside the door, he's going to shank him. Uh, that's actually in the 40k background. That's in the law. So again, we take it with a pinch of salt because how much of the law is contradictory, etc, etc. But I don't believe it is actually down to Erebus and Corferon that are to blame here. It does seem to me that an excellent explanation as to why we don't have Lorgar as a model in 40k, why we don't have Corax as a model in 40k, is that Corax is simply waiting for Lorgar to set foot outside so that he can murder him, and uh, Lorgar is simply too terrified of Corvus Corax to do so. Uh, let's move on. Uh, next one up to bat then is this. Forge World Insignia and the Votan League Insignia are in fact the remains of Dark Age corporate logos and both the Forge Worlds and Votan are the result of corporate survival planning at the start of the Age of Strife. Huzzah for capitalism! This one, in case you hadn't guessed, came from Willard, from my Tale of Four Gamers crowd. Uh, yeah, I can believe that, actually. I think it'd be quite cool if someone did, like, a, a League of Votan army or something and maybe modified the BMW symbol or uh, the Audi symbol or something to represent uh, their particular league. That would be quite cool. Uh, likewise, I think it'd be quite cool if I, if I had, like, a big, cool pickup truck, uh, which I would love. Um, I could put, like, the Adeptus Mechanicus cog symbol on the front in place of whatever car badge was there. Don't know why I'm going with cars on this, except it seems like it crosses over quite nicely with 40k. Yeah, I mean, I can believe that. We know that a hell of a lot happens during the Age of Strife, and um, roleplay systems like Shadowrun, uh, the... the Kim Stanley Robinson Mars trilogy that I'm reading at the moment suggests that transnational corporations will eventually become the new superpower in place of nations as such. 
So I can fully believe that some kind of mega corporation uh, would have uh, eventually, during the Great Expansion, reached out across the galaxy and essentially put in place long-term survival plans. I mean, you might even have a situation where a Votan is the corporate AI that was put in charge of the company to ensure continuity down the millennia. And now what's left of it, hiding at the galactic core, is, you know, the, the Disney Corp League of Votan. Uh, or, um, <laughs> I don't know, the Mattel Bolter. Uh, yeah, that's a cool one. I quite like that, and I can see that fully fitting into the 40k background. And if nothing says grimdark like capitalism, and especially end-stage capitalism. Moving on. Uh, the Orcs consider the 40k universe to be their version of Valhalla. The galaxy has things to fight, Squigbeer exists, and they have all the boys to scrap with. I mean, this is this is absolutely 100% true. I suppose I suspect most Orcs aren't really sad when they die, simply on the basis it means that they have to go back to living again before they can die and come back to Valhalla. This, of course, is the Nakmak Fiegel, uh, Fiegel theory from Terry Pratchett's Discworld, that none of the Fiegels are sad when they die, except perhaps that slight sensation that they're missing out on some fun while they go back to the living world. Uh, yeah, I, I can absolutely believe that if it were for the fact that I think, uh, and we'll see this through a lot of these uh, conspiracy theories, orc religious belief does a lot of heavy lifting in these uh, conspiracy theories. And if it were the case that they believed this to be their version of Valhalla, then I suspect that there would be things that would be even better for the orcs. Like they'd have bigger guns, for one thing. They'd be orcs staggering around under the weight of guns that even they couldn't lift. I mean, actually, now that you think about it, moving on. Uh, the e Okay, there is a whole slew of these now that I'm going to go through, which is the Emperor Conspiracy Theories. The Emperor was created by the Eldar as a psychic beacon that would draw the Tyranids to the galaxy. They would shelter in the webway whilst all other life, and by extension the Chaos Gods, was wiped out. I mean... Okay, so we're going to go through quite a few. The Emperor was created by X Conspiracy Theories. I'm not a fan of this one. Uh, no criticism to the person who's contributed it, but I don't think it adds up simply from a mathematical point of view. If the Eldar really did create the Emperor to be a psychic beacon to uh, some of the Tyranids to the galaxy, A, you'd think, well, why would they have to create it in an, an alternative race when they're one of the more psychically powerful races? Uh, but B, they themselves are responsible for the creation of one of the Chaos Gods. So even if even if every other living thing in the galaxy was exterminated when they emerged from the webway into what is presumably a completely lifeless and denuded galaxy, uh, they would still have Slanesh to contend with because Slanesh's basis is within the Eldar psyche. But beyond that, I can't see the, ba the benefit to the Eldar of completely stripping the galaxy of all biological life by summoning the Tyranids to the galaxy. Because the Tyranids, we've, we've established, when they hit a, a living world, they eat every single thing on it. They strip it of the atmosphere. They strip every possible amino acid and mineral useful mineral out of the rock. They leave essentially denuded, lifeless balls of, of not even carbon, dust behind in their, in, in their wake. Uh, I can't see what there would be in it for the Eldar in doing so. I mean, surely they could just retreat to the webway and abandon the rest of the galaxy rather than have to summon the Tyranids. And beyond that, we know that the Tyranids were summoned by the lighting of the Pharos, which doesn't really have that much to do with the Emperor and was more to do with Reboot Gulliman trying to find a replacement for the Astronomicon. So yeah, I'm not a fan of this theory. I think we can mark this one busted. Uh, but, moving on, uh, the Emperor is an AI. I like this one. I mean, we've heard a lot of suggestions that the Emperor is uh, some kind of Dark Age weapon that was uh, created during the Age of Darkness and uh, essentially has remained beyond the bounds of humanity's control, uh, whether it's um, some kind of psychic bioweapon or whether he is some kind of like genetically engineered new being that was supposed to become you know, the, the saviour of, of mankind or a new tool for the usage of mankind. But the idea that he is an artificial intelligence... Wow. Okay, so reasoning it through, the Necrons are the only other example of AI that I can think of except for the League of Votan. Now, take it one at a time. The Necrons are beings who were alive, who were transplanted into metal bodies, but do not therefore have a psychic presence because they do not have a soul. Do they count as AI under those circumstances? I'm not entirely sure. We know for definite, though, the Iron Kin and the Votan within the League of Votan are AI, but neither the Iron Kin nor, as far as we can tell, the AI giant supercomputer Votan themselves are psychically powerful beings. 
there are psychers within the Votan race, but those are obviously genetically created bro Grimnir brothers, Grim brothers, uh, within the leagues of Votan, created at the behest of the AIs, rather than the AIs being psychers themselves. Would the Emperor be some kind of, of uh, electronic being, therefore? I'm not sure. Does Could he be a biological artificial intelligence? And where do you draw the line, I suppose, between uh, a biological entity and an artificial intelligence under those circumstances? We're diving into some fairly deep sci-fi lore at that point. I'm not sure we can get a clear answer. Taking that one step further, though, the Emperor is... This is another conspiracy theory that cropped up fairly regularly. The Emperor is, rather than a being who has uh, been around for 8,000 years... Um, Emperor's references being perhaps Gilgamesh or Conan from the Conan stories that he goes all the way back to ancient Samaria whether or not he is in fact instead a man-made creation created as a weapon during the Dark Age of technology that either completely overthrew its masters that is perhaps responsible for the Dark Age of technology I mean we know that the Emperor has plans, that the Thunder Warriors were a stage in his plan before the Primarch Project and the Astartes Project and the Great Crusade and the eventual Webway Project. Were the Men of Iron the heart of his projects? Was he initially a creation, a super-intelligent, genetically engineered, omnipowerful psyche being created in a laboratory during the Golden Age of Technology before the Fall, who led to the creation and the eventual uprising of the Men of Iron as part of a master plan to save mankind. I mean, I suppose it's possible. Any number of things are possible when you start talking about the Emperor. Um, personally, I think we've seen enough of his background to suggest that he may have been around for longer. Certainly other individuals such as Perpetuals like uh, John Grammaticus, uh, Oleander Person, were present earlier on in the history of mankind and seem to recognise the Emperor from that period, suggesting that he predates the Dark Age of Technology. But just saying that and thinking about it, we have to remember, maybe I should put this back on for a minute, we have to remember the warp exists and the warp enables time travel, that within the warp all time is relative and that distance and time are meaningless in the warp, so as, as it is possible to travel in distance in the warp, it is equally possible to travel in time if you knew what you were doing. If, for example, you were an omnipowerful, uh, omnipresent psyche being, could the Emperor have been created during the Dark Age of Technology and then travelled backwards in time to the dawn of mankind and then been present all the way through the history of mankind, even as far as shaping human events to lead to his own creation? Wow, we have gone tinfoil hat territory really fast here. Um, yeah, I think that's eminently possible. My personal favourite, incidentally, is this. Um, we know that the Emperor was present and is linked to the first murder. Uh, the first murder, if you've not read The Emperor of Mankind, is one of the, the first demons, really, that were created by mankind. Much like uh, Slanesh is a creation of the Eldar, the first murder uh, is now known as Drachnion, the sword that is wielded by Abaddon the Despoiler. But the demon bound within it... It was created at the first moment that one member of mankind murdered another member of mankind. Consider this, my tinfoil hat-wearing friends. The Emperor could be Biblical Cain. Never mind Gilgamesh, never mind Conan. I mean, he could be both of those as well. But we know that Cain was destined not to die that there was reference within the Bible to Cain having the mark placed upon his forehead and being banished to the land of Nod in the east, uh, but told that no creature should harm him and he should uh, live out the rest of his days rather than see paradise. What if that was the birth of perpetualism? What if the emperor, as the first murderer, the act, putting aside the, the Christian and um, biblical references and, and the, the other elements of the Old Testament, what if the Old Testament ba is allegedly supposed to have been based upon the idea that the very act of the first human murder created the first murder demon, but likewise created the first perpetual? What if that is why the Emperor is a perpetual and cannot die? And in that vein, I'm going to take my tinfoil hat off again because it's slipping, let's move on to the next one, which is this. Uh, the Emperor is not the one on the throne. Ooh. Okay, so the Golden Throne. Uh, the Golden Throne is a life support mechanism that uh, is allegedly keeping the Emperor minutes from death and that through that he is able to over watch over mankind and maintain a beacon, the Astronomicon, that enables the rest of mankind to navigate and control the galaxy. 
It was not, as far as we can tell, originally intended to be a massive life support mechanism. At least that wasn't its sole purpose. We know that the Emperor wasn't the person that was destined originally to sit on it. We know that Magnus was supposed to be the one that sat on it. That the goal of the Emperor was to take mankind into the webway and thus completely eradicate the Chaos Gods, eliminate the need for to warp travel altogether, and that the control over the entrance to the webway project would have been controlled by the Golden Throne, which would have massively amplified the psychic powers of whoever sat in it. To that end, it contained within it a life support mechanism, which presumably would have been able there to prevent whichever individual sat in it from burning out. As, as far as we can tell, it happened to Malkador when he sat on it whilst the Emperor left the Golden Throne to go and fight Horus. More on that in a minute. So what if the Emperor isn't the one on the throne? Well, firstly, who could it be? What if it's still Malkador? Malkador the Sigilite. We know that... One of his last acts, um, whilst he was on the Golden Throne, was to move Titan out of sync with the rest of the galaxy for thousands of years to protect the project that he and the Emperor had been working on there, the Grey Knights, uh, that he sent his own personal knights, the Knights of the Sigilite, to Titan just before this happened. Certainly that would be something that would need a vast amount of psychic power to move an entire moon out of sequence with the rest of the galaxy, but without shoving it all the way directly into the warp. Um, there is this implication that Malkador burned out during his time on the Golden Throne, that that's how he finally came to an end, and that the Emperor then was placed upon the Golden Throne to utilise its life support system and to uh, enable his psychic presence to endure and guide the human, human uh, Imperium. But what if it is still Malkador? Well, first of all, that would be where is the Emperor? Now, he could still be in the Webway. He could still be fighting against uh, the forces of chaos in the Webway with some of his custodians. But I think the rest of the custodians would know if that had happened. Uh, he could be dead. He may not have survived the, the battle with Horus. And he may just be dead. And the humanity all the long have been believing in a deity that doesn't exist. Alternatives, though. Um, maybe he died and then resurrected. I mean, this is an ongoing theory, and this links into another conspiracy theory, which is that the Golden Throne is what is keeping the Emperor from resurrecting. That uh, if the Emperor were to be removed from the Golden Throne, then the uh, perpetual energy within him would enable him to resurrect again. And of course, there's a whole subset of uh, the Inquisition that believe that that is, it is vital, essentially, to allow the Emperor to die or that he can be resurrected. Um, equally, maybe that already happened. Maybe he is out in the galaxy uh, fighting already. Maybe he's out beyond the Galactic Rim fighting the Tyranids. I, I, I'm tempted to say I think personally that the Emperor probably is still on the Golden Throne. Um, I am one of the supporters, and this perhaps links into my own personal Inquisition philosophy, that given we know the Emperor is a perpetual, and we know that pretty much every other perpetual eventually resurrected, if the Emperor were to be removed from the Golden Throne, I personally hold to the conspiracy theory that he would then resurrect. Whether or not that's something Games Workshop will ever do in the background, we shall see. Let's move on. The Emperor is Malice. Now, it's spelled Malice. I mean, Malus is who they mean. Malus, if those of you who don't remember, going way back in the Road Trader days, was the fifth Chaos God. It's like the Beetle who left before they became famous. Um, Malus has had mentions in 40k background since the date of Rogue Trader. I mean, in terms of there's a, a, a Space Marine group of Chaos Renegades called the Sons of Malice in black and white colour scheme. Um, Games Workshop haven't really touched this with a barge pole. There is a, a conspiracy theory that here, that the Emperor is in fact Malice, who is going to become him. Again, if we refer back to the fact that the warp is untethered from time, then if the Emperor were destined to become the next Chaos God, it is not beyond the realms of possibility that mentions of him might stray backwards in time to before he ascended to become a Chaos God. Why he would become a Chaos God and not simply a God, I'm not sure. Uh, linked to this, someone's thrown on a conspiracy theory that uh, Malkador is actually the one in charge and the Emperor is just the Angel or a Man of Gold. Now again, I suppose this links back to the idea of the Emperor being um, some kind of creation of uh, mankind rather than him being a long-term living entity who's been around for thousands of years. Is the Emperor merely a figurehead, I suppose? Is it a bit like the giant head and the man behind the curtain from The Wizard of Oz? Was Malkador only ever the individual um, in charge and the Emperor merely thought that he was leading the Great Crusade? Was he merely a figurehead? 
I don't see it myself. There's sufficient narrative to suggest that there is a strong bond between Malkador and the Emperor, whether perhaps the two of them have been around since the dawn of time together, whether... Um, oh, God. Okay, so maybe if the Emperor is the first ever perpetual, is Malkador his father? Um, the first human? Wow, okay, maybe. Um, the first psyker, maybe, who in turn gave birth to an even greater psyker beyond him? Anything's possible. I, I, I think most conspiracy theories relating to the Emperor will turn out to be wrong. The Emperor, it's... He is such a central and potent figure within 40k. I mean, you almost can't have 40k without thinking about the Emperor of Mankind. That to try and make up a conspiracy theory that would explain or understand him just doesn't work. But it's a cool one. The idea that, that, that Malkador might actually be the puppet master, that's definitely a cool one. You can see at the top there, this is going to tie us into... Um, there's a few conspiracy theories linked to the Emperor and Sanguinius here. So, I've, I've seen this one do the rounds for a few years now, that Dante, Mephiston and the Sanguinor are, are all actually aspects of Sanguinius. That if they could combine somehow, like Voltron, then uh, <laughs> Sanguinius could return from the dead. Certainly they all seem to bear aspects of him. Mephiston has his psychic might, uh, his uh, overcoming of the Red Thirst, uh, the Sanguinor seems to have almost his divine uh, light, and certainly his wings. And Dante, does he have perhaps his humanity? I mean, yeah, possibly. And if the Games Workshop did want to bring Sanguinius back, like we've seen the Lion return, we've seen Gulliman return, I, I'd hope that we'd see Russ before we saw Sanguinius return, but if Games Workshop wanted to, that is definitely a way that they could go. But Sanguinius actually... Hey, so here's another thing, looking to that, Sanguinius actually killed... Horus, and in so doing was so imbued with warp energy that this created the black rage that echoes down through time, infecting all his future descendants, that it was Sanguinius who fought the Emperor, and when Sanguinius died it allowed his uh, corruption to spread psychically to the rest of his sons. So in essence I think there's a few different conspiracy theories here that it's it's somehow perhaps the exposure to the, the warp energy at Horus's passing that caused... Um, the, the Blood Angels and all their future ch successor chapters to be cursed. But that linked to that as well, the idea that it wasn't actually Horus that mortally wounded the Emperor at the end, that it was Sanguinius. That uh, all the stories, all the propaganda of Sanguinius mortally wounded Horus, put a chink in his armour, but died in the process, but that was the sacrifice that enabled the Emperor to kill Horus, even if it nearly cost him his life is all propaganda, that is all part of Imperial lies and the Imperial Creed, presumably propagated by Rogel Dawn, who of course was present in the aftermath and allegedly put the Emperor into the Golden Throne. I mean, if you wanted a way to, to provide an inspiring story, a story of noble sacrifice by an angelic being, you can't go far wrong in that. A lot of rel religions have started with a lot less. Uh, presuming that's what Dawn's intent was. I mean, in one of the more cynical point of view, if Dawn simply didn't want to break the spirit of the Imperium, to shatter it forever by letting them know that even Sanguinius had turned at the end to chaos, I suppose I can see it. Dan Abnett's uh, final, up, hopefully final and upcoming novel in the uh, End of the Death trilogy uh, will give us some clarity on this, I'm sure. Um, but again, I suppose what we have to remember is that the Imperium lies and Black Library novels are nothing more than an extension of those lies. Uh, moving on. The Emperor had created a method to absorb back the life of the Primarchs just in case and he used it after Sanguinius killed Horus to avoid dying. I, I don't know if that's supposed to be Horus killed Sanguinius and he therefore absorbed Sanguinius' life energy to enable him to survive his battle with Horus. Well, whether it's supposed to be linking into the previous conspiracy theory that Sanguinius killed Horus, the Emperor absorbed Horus' energy and then killed Sanguinius and absorbed that as well and that's why he's able to keep going. I, we've not really seen any evidence of this. Um, certainly... The rules of energy suggest that energy cannot be created or destroyed, merely redistributed. Although how you cope with having a massive dimension that seems to be untethered to both time and space, which is nothing but energy, within that factor of uh, the theory of relativity, I'm not sure. But in essence, I suppose the idea that if the Emperor gave some of his power to uh, his sons to create them, that he could somehow reabsorb that back... Uh, I suppose it would beg the question of, would it serve his purpose? If that was as simple as that, then all he'd have to do is reabsorb Gulliman, reabsorb the lion, 
reabsorb the rest of the surviving demon Primarchs to restore himself and put himself back on track. I don't buy it myself. I think that that's perhaps too cynical approach to it. Certainly the Emperor had a troubled relationship with his creations, whilst some of them he appeared to be like a father figure, others he treated as nothing more than disposable tools. And linked into that is the suggestion here, another conspiracy theory for you, that the Emperor could have removed or deactivated the Butcher's Nails from Angron whenever he wished, but had already foreseen the fall of Horus and wanted to hand the traitors a broken tool, a broken weapon, that would undermine their cause. Again, I, I don't see it. If he had foreseen everything, if everything is just as planned, uh, then it would suggest that the Emperor knew that everything that was going to happen thus far, including his uh, eventual put incarceration in the Golden Throne, was going to happen, and it was all part of some grand master strategy that will eventually come to light. I'm not convinced. Certainly I do accept, I think the Emperor could have removed the Butcher's Nails from Angron had he seen fit. He, he was able to create Angron. You would hope that he could fix him if that was with something he wanted to do. I, I, I'm leaning towards the idea that the Emperor simply didn't want to fix Angron because Angron was effect, an effective tool as he was and that he didn't see Angron as anything more than a tool so left him as he was to continue doing what he needed him to do which was butchering those who didn't toe the line and uh, inspiring fear to, to encourage compliance. One final Emperor one for you then and then we'll move on. Uh, that the Emperor made a deal with the Chaos Gods to bump up his natural power level to something exponentially higher in exchange for them, for him guiding humanity towards Chaos, that instead he used that opportunity to, ter that opportunity to turn humanity away from Chaos using the Webway Project, knowing that it would piss Chaos off and put a target on his back, which is perfect because he wanted humanity to worship him as an undead god martyr that can truly ascend to Godhood, fight Chaos on its own terms in the warp. That he would become more powerful because humanity is the most populous race in the galaxy and was starting to emerge as a fully psychic race whilst worshipping him. The Chaos Gods call him the Anathema because they exist in a place where everything is occurring at the same time, so they are dealing with a double cross from him now, even though he doesn't yet exist as a god within real space, so that when Chaos see him, they see him as something that can and will fight them on an equal footing. Lot to unpack there. So I suppose this comes back to what we were talking about a minute ago with the Emperor as just as planned, that... He somehow knew that he could double-cross the Chaos Gods by gaining a power bump from them, but using that instead to defeat them, but that he knew that they would in turn try to defeat him, so he would... Uh, I'm just kind of stacking conspiracy theories on top of conspiracy theories. Yeah, I feel uh, my brain might be overheating. It needs tinfoil again. So that he would end up getting mortally wounded, so he would have to end up on the Golden Throne, so that then humanity would worship him as a god, so that... He could use their worship to empower himself to become the god he needed to be all along to fight the gods of chaos. And they knew this, but somehow still went along with it anyway. That's where I think this starts to fall down. I mean, as anybody who is good at playing just as planned, like the Emperor seems to have been in a lot of these conspiracy theories, it's Zinch. And I can't believe that Zinch would foresee the Emperor doing all of this and allow it to happen unless, I suppose, and uh, maybe it's because I've taken the tinfoil off, Zinch planned all of this and is playing an even higher level of ninth dimensional chess uh, in that he has planned for the Emperor to do this. Now this, this comes down to almost the, the Bill and Ted's bogus journey phone box conversation of Ah, I knew you would do that and I planted the key. Ah, but we you knew you would do that and planted the gun. I can't see a way out of that without my brain unspooling and pouring out of my ears. What I do think is this, that there is an assumption that the Chaos Gods gave the Emperor something. Now we know that he needed raw warp energy to create the Primarchs, because the Primarchs weren't simply corporeal beings, they were also beings of energy. And maybe this is where it comes down to the idea that energy can't be created or destroyed, merely redistributed. That he took some of that raw energy of the warp, because the raw energy of the warp is itself human energy, it's human psychic energy. And it's Eldar psychic energy, it's like the energy coming from a whole host of other weird Xenos races. But in particular, as the, the original poster points out, Humanity being the most uh, populous race in the galaxy, it is, for the most part, human psychic energy. And maybe he used some of that human psychic energy to create the Primarchs, essentially to reinvest souls into something which until now had been soulless. Which, I suppose, begs the question, if we take the idea that the Emperor is some kind of genetically created individual... And what I've suggested, the issue with him being an AI, being the fact that AIs, much like the Necrons, are soulless, they have no presence in the warp. 
But what if somebody did find a way to siphon off sufficient warp energy to create a to create a soul? What if the Emperor is a corporeal human soul? What if he is a corporeal compilation of millions of billions of human souls echoing backwards and forwards through time? And he knew that he would need some of that soul energy from the warp to create the Primarchs, which are themselves merely extensions of his will and his power. Hmm. Okay. Moving on. Let's 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 step back from all of that a little bit. Um, let's talking about Primarchs. Let's talk about the second and the eleventh. There's a couple of good conspiracy theories on this. Um, the first is one that I mean, this has been doing the round since way back in the days of fifth edition fantasy. But the second Primarch is Sigmar. So okay, Sigmar. For anyone who's not a big fan, and maybe you just think Sigmar, Age of Sigmar. Ew. Sigmar was the man god Conan Gilgamesh character in Warhammer we'll Fantasy Battle, because you've got one in 40k, why not have one in Fantasy Battle? But he was far more akin to a traditional Conan, a barbarian warrior who united the tribes of the biggest conglomeration of humans in the old world, forged them into an empire that will resound down the millennia, uh, ensuring stability within the core of the old world. That over time he became worshipped as a god, and he is certainly described as having properties akin to a demigod, being more potent perhaps than any other human that was around at that time. The automatic assumption, therefore, is that the Warhammer Fantasy Battle World is a world in the 40k universe, and that he is actually one of the missing Primarchs. I don't accept this because at no point in the Warhammer Fantasy Battle does it go, and lo, during the end of Sigmar's reign, did a great flotilla of ships descend from on the sky and take him away, and then come back and tell us we had to pay them taxes, or they'd kill us all in our beds. Yeah, I don't buy it, is the short answer. I, I, I think Warhammer Fantasy Battle is one thing, 40k is another. Yes, there are weird trans-dimensional frogs that cross between the two, and occasionally those frogs have machine guns. But let's move on from that. The other theory, though, in connection with the 2nd and the 11th is this. That the 2nd Legion and the 11th Legion were never wiped out. That was a lie that was propagated by Malkador and by the Emperor uh, for their own goals. That those two legions and all the Imperial assets that were otherwise recorded as being lost in the 2nd Rangdan Crusade were not lost and never went anywhere near that Xenos Enclave. Instead, that Crusade fleet was sent out of the galaxy towards the farthest of the Maginalic Cloud Dwarf Galaxies with the intention of them going even further still, just in case something were to ever happen to the Milky Way, Tyranids. And humanity would therefore still survive somewhere out in the void of space that the Emperor then rewrote everyone involved in the planning of the actual designation of the fleet's memory, and all records of it were changed to make reference to the Rangdan Crusade. I, this is a good piece of imperial inter internal retconning. The idea that um, the Emperor planned for every eventuality, now that I can believe, and that he foresaw that something might happen to the galaxy one day, but if he could take a pocket of that, perhaps with two loyal sons and a whole host of humanity and the great tech priests that he had access to, throw them out of the galaxy, far, far away, on the basis that even if the whole galaxy somehow disappears into a warp pocket, humanity would survive, and thus his legacy would be assured. That one I quite like. I, I can get behind that one. Um, whilst we're on the subject of space marines, chapters of unknown heritage. Okay, so let's just rattle them off. Tra Bl Blood Ravens, Thousand Sons, Minotaurs, Iron Warriors, Death Guard, uh, Mortifactors, Death Guard, Silver Skulls, Iron Warriors, Marines Malevolent, Iron Warriors. Uh, honestly, were there any Iron Warriors who actually fought in the Great Cru in the Horus Heresy on behalf of Perturabo? Was it just him and a couple of guys and all the rest of the Iron Warriors flipped in the Vs and disappeared off to go and, you know, change their colours and fight alongside Reboot Gulliman? Uh, yeah, I love the idea of the fact that multiple other loyalist chapters now have their boots firmly centred in uh, Traitor Primarchs. Uh, we've got some of the more recent ones as well, but since uh, Belisarius Call got into the mix, uh, the Sons of the Phoenix, which um, I wonder who they could be that related to, um, the Carcharodons, a lot of different theories on this, some suggesting that they're descended from the Raven Guard who were exiled by Korax for being too hardcore even for Emo Kin himself, um, some suggesting that their uh, DNA is linked to a couple of chapters, uh, perhaps Black Eyes, Pale Skin, Hmm. Could be Raven God, could be Night Lords. Uh, overwhelming ferocity, uh, but perhaps without some large metal cyberkinetic nails nailed into their head. Uh, yeah, world eaters. I like the idea of that. I like the idea that 
in the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, those who had not turned traitor were not summarily dispatched, but were not necessarily rewarded, but were at the very least put to use in some way. Even if they, they lost their heritage, I suppose in some respects, if you wanted a revenge upon a traitor brother, what better way than to expunge their memory and do it so that even their own descendants don't remember them as their, their primogenitor. Yeah, that's a cool one. Uh, we're going to move on to some Xenos here now. Uh, so, little little pocket I'm going to call the Tau. There's a few different theories about the Tau. Uh, let's start with this one. Uh, the Tau were created by and or are being groomed by the Necrons to be their new physical bodies to undo biotransference. So, okay, the Necrons gave away their corporeal forms to become the Nettle uh, monstrous machine men that we all know and fear now. But the idea that the Tau are somehow being created by them, I mean, we've seen zero evidence of that. I mean, even down to nothing within their technology seems to have much of an echo of Necron technology. Uh, there isn't the living metal alloys that the Necrons employ. There isn't the Gauss technology. There isn't the zero um, level kinetic thrust that the Necron ships employ. Uh, the faster the light travel that the Tau employ uh, is only just over the speed of light. It's why it still takes years for Tau fleets to travel between star systems. I, I think this one's a bust, personally. Uh, here's another Tau one then. The Ethereals are mind-controlled by the Nagai, and the rest of the Tau species have no idea. They just believe the Empire is going from strength to strength. Uh, so I initially had to look this one up. I was not up to speed on my Tau background on this one. The Nagai are a species of mind-control worms that the Tau Empire apparently encountered at some point during the 6th edition Tau Codex. Uh, they initially fought a series of almost uh, exterminatory wars against them, before suddenly coming to a peace treaty with them. And the Nagai now serve as advisors to the Ethereal cast. Yeah, I mean, this one is entirely possible. It might explain why the Ethereal cast sometimes acts like such murderous, double-dealing bastards compared to other members of the Ethereal cast. For example, the uh, the, the contrast between uh, Aun Shi and the Space Pope. Um, yeah, I, I would be intrigued to see a novel where this is revealed to be true. I know it's included in there as a throwaway piece of background information, but I would be love to see, you know, Commander Farsight actually discover that the Tau Empire has been infiltrated from within. It's kind of a Dark Skies type conspiracy theory. Uh, yeah, cool. Okay. Uh, uh, one final Tau-based one. Uh, this is it's suggested it's gone from conspiracy theory to canon. Uh, the Crute. The crew technology is so weird and advanced because they fought they fought until near extinction against the orcs early in crew history. They absorbed so much orcoid DNA that the some le same level of the green skin gestalt field effect present within the crew. Um, essentially, I suppose an argument to be then that the crew have. Much, so much in common with the Orcs that they have genetic memory of technology, uh, albeit their technology rather than necessarily Orc technology, and I, I said that Orc religion would play a part in some of these conspiracy theories, I suppose in much the same way that it's true because the Orcs believe it's true, maybe Crute stuff is true because the Crute believe it to be true, or even that the Orcs believe the Crute believe it to be true. Uh, another one, though, that the Crute can extract memories through their DNA. The Crute through sh should, through gestation or by consuming dead elders, have a string of memories going all the way back to whatever trait first emerged in their species. I suppose in some respects, then, the most far-flung Crute mercenary carries a faint memory of the trees of Pesh. Gosh, isn't that so sweet? It's kind of like, I suppose, a, a suggestion that the crew are, in many respects, like the blue cat people from Avatar. That's why they can interact with every other species that comes from the crew homeworld. And that they're out there in the wider galaxy, having left Pandora behind. Oh my god, Pesh is Pandora, isn't it? Imagine if James Cameron had decided to make blue bird people instead. Oh, there we go. Um, moving on then into the vein of Orc. It's true because the Orcs believe it to be true. Uh, I'm going to briefly throw up here first one of my own personal ones. I'm one that's so often be thrown around. I don't think it even counts as a conspiracy theory. I think it's probably just classed as true. Um, the Emperor is alive because the Orcs believe him to be alive. So I, I could do a whole video, and I may well do a whole video on comparative 40k religion at some point. You'll get to watch me fashion myself a little dog collar out of cardboard with a set of scissors. Um, <laughs> Orcs believe it's true, therefore it's true. Orc spacecrafts fly even though they shouldn't because Orcs believe it should happen. Orc vehicles drive, Orc guns shoot rather than just, you know, explode in the hand of their user because Orcs believe it to be possible. The Emperor 
killed the most powerful orc beings that were ever alive. Therefore, he is, to all intents and purposes, the most powerful enemy the orcs have ever faced. And so race memory being passed down through orc DNA, along with their strange orc psychic power belief system, means that the Emperor is still alive because the orcs believe him to be so. Linked to that then, Yarrick, Commissar Yarrick, old Baelai himself, is still alive because orcish belief dictates that he just will not die. Now, I know he wasn't in the most recent Imperial Guard Codex, and I think that was a mistake. I think GW should bring him back. He is still by far one of the best characters the Imperial Guard ever created, after Caiaphas Cain. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and I can't say it, Jürgen. I cannot say that Jürgen is a good character. Baldrick in space, no. <laughs> okay, and the, the other theory, of course, is that after he was in some way killed, his body was stolen by freebooters on behalf of Orchimedes so he could be resurrected for Gazgol so that Gazgol would still have someone to have a proper scrap with. Yeah, I mean, I, I can believe that. Um, the other explanation here, this is thrown up alongside belief that uh, the reason why Armageddon is so important is it's Angeron's original homeworld of Dashith, which is why he went there to build a big monolith in the jungle. I'll come back to that in a minute. Commissar Yarrick is a perpetual. I mean, a lot of stuff can be explained in 40k when people are perpetuals. I can believe that, actually, that old Baylai is a perpetual. It would seem a bit odd if he came back with the power claw. I mean, yeah, I'm a perpetual, but so is my power claw. Maybe not. Um, as far as Armageddon being Dashith, I don't accept that. Armageddon is, of course, Ulanor. That's why the orcs keep gravitating back there. Uh, one final couple for you, then. Uh, the... Tyranids, I've heard this sometimes, the Tyranids aren't invading the galaxy, they're running away from something that's bigger and badder that's going to arrive soon. Well, I mean, A, yeah, I mean, that's been a trope in sci-fi going back in time of a memorial. This is something terrible alien we're fighting. Oh my god, they were just fleeing, they were animals fleeing from a wildfire in essence. Yeah, okay, I don't know that necessarily they would have needed to have been attracted by the beacon on Pharos if they were merely running from something. That being said, there was a conspiracy theory that was doing the rounds for a lot of time and then has disappeared in the last 10, 15 years, which was, we know that there were four Catan star gods that uh, survived mostly intact at the end of the War in Heaven. The Nightbringer, the Deceiver, the Void Dragon, and the one only known as the Outsider, who it is suggested was put outside this in some way. Now, some suggest that means that he's trapped in the webway, uh, Catan being entirely non-psychic entities, he wouldn't have any way of coping with being trapped in the webway or escaping. The other popular theory, of course, is that he's trapped outside the galaxy and has been massing an army of, you know, essentially semi-automatous uh, death bots out there, uh, which the Tyranids have encountered and have veered away from and are now fleeing through our galaxy, trying to gobble up as much biomass as possible to escape the inevitable horde of replicator-style droids that are coming to turn the entire galaxy into grey dust. Yeah, I, I mean, it's possible. I think, to be honest, the Tyranids are scary enough as they are. They don't need anything bigger and badder for them to be running away from. I mean, as it stands, I don't think we've even seen all that the Tyranids can generate. We, uh, Games Workshop keep generating new big monster bugs for us to fight with the Tyranids, uh, which means that there doesn't really need to be a big, ba a bigger, badder thing coming from outside the galaxy. They can simply create even nastier Tyranids as the game progresses through the decades. Um, one final conspiracy theory to leave you with, and then I'll uh, let you think about these yourself. It's this. Anyone who has read the Horus Heresy novels uh, will know that the first chapter, the first page of the first chapter is, I was there the day Horus slew the Emperor. Yes, Dan Abnett's big fake out. Uh, in which the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet arrive on planet 19 of their conquest uh, and encounter a system of nine worlds, the third planet of which purports to uh, be inhabited by humans. In fact, it purports to be the legendary home of all humans, Earth, ruled over by the Emperor of Mankind. Uh, Horus, of course, goes out of his way to disabuse him of this knowledge, albeit by doing so sets in root motion the uh, act that would lead us to the Horus Heresy eventually. The conspiracy theory is this. 6319, as it's known, is in fact the real planet Earth. Now, I actually went away and did some research on this. Now, nine planets in the system. Well, OK, Pluto doesn't count as a planet anymore, so in theory we could discount it there and then. But let's say it means nine stellar bodies. Nine, nine, a star, a yellow sun, as it's described, and nine rocky planetary items, which we could include Pluto in if we so wish. Um, the third one out, yeah, okay, that would seem to match with where Earth 
would be. And we know that at least three others within the system are described as being inhabited. So we know that's Mars and, I don't know, Venus, uh, whether Mercury's got some inhabitants on it, whatever. It's possible that the system that we think of as the Sol system is not the Sol system, that the Emperor and all the human race are in fact simply descendants of colonists who arrived on that world and decided that it was so like Earth and so like our home system that they would name everything after it, like Mars, like Earth, and then, you know, tragedy and devastation occurred to the point where so little is left of uh, the planet that only the names remain, the Himalayan mountains, so named after the greatest mountains on our birth world, uh, the rocky red planet that was fourth out from the sun that was named Mars in honour of the original uh, Mars in our home system. Here's why it's not true, and it's a fun little nugget, but it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's busted. Firstly, here is the map Games Workshop produced of the galaxy. As you can see, uh, Earth is connected on the outer edge of one of the spiral arms, and here we have a map of our galaxy from a scientific website that I just snatched off of Google. But again, as you can see, Earth is located on the outer edge of one of the spiral arms, so we're in roughly the right place. What I think utterly disproves it is the presence of sufficient geographical features and historical relics that mean that Earth, or Terra has to be Earth and Mars has to be Mars. Olympus Mons, first and foremost, the, 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 the most uh, mighty volcano in our solar system, is present on Mars in the Terran solar system. The uh, Labyrinthus Noctis, with all the various secrets hidden there within, is likewise present on the Red Planet, as it is present on the Red Planet on our, in our uh, reality at this time point in our, in our history. The Himalayan Mountains, the highest mountains on Terra, again coinciding with the presence of the Himalayas in our uh, continuity, but also the presence of things such as the archaeological records, such as when the dig is carried out in Alexandria in the Thousand Sons novel, we essentially see relics left over from the ancient Egyptian race present at that time. The um, fact of the Atlantic Basin coinciding with the presence of the Atlantic Basin in our continuity. There are sufficient geographical similarities between the two, even down to the, the gas giants, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, there would have to have been a uh, crossover of such a degree between that and what was present in 6319 to convince me that 6319 was in fact the original home world of our species. That isn't present in the novel, it's never expanded upon, I, I therefore don't accept it. The only alternative I would posit is this. Again, we come back to the fact that the warp is uh, a fluid um, connection to time and space and that something can be present in multiple times. Present, of course, the fact that there was an orc war boss who so liked his favourite gun that upon travelling back in time by vagaries of warp travel, he went out of his way to find himself, shoot himself in the head so he'd have a spare of his favourite gun. There is nothing to say that 6319 is not our Earth, or rather that it is not an Earth. I am not entirely convinced that it isn't, for example, a parallel Earth. Perhaps connected into our galaxy through the vagaries of warp travel, perhaps passes through a warp storm that innate during the uh, Age of Darkness, during the great warp storms that dominated the galaxy until the beginning of the Great Crusade. There is nothing to say that an alternative universe, Terra, did not pass through a warp rift and arrive in our galaxy, where it utterly believed that that Sol system was still in its own dimensional system, until the uh, great you know, fleets arrived in orbit and disabused them of that notion. It would be a tragedy in some respects that if it worked out that there were two Earths, two distinct birth worlds of humankind, one that hadn't been utterly destroyed in the same way that decades of climate change and uh, war had devastated Earth to turn it into the terror of the 41st millennium, or 31st millennium as it was at the time of the Horus heresy, and yet humanity came along and basically bombed it. Um, on that somewhat depressing note, I shall leave you. Um, let me know in the comments below if you've enjoyed this video and what your favourite 40k conspiracy theories are, whether you've got any thoughts on any of the conspiracies that I've floated during this video. Uh, I'm going to put my tinfoil hat back on before the Necrons and the naggy mindworms come to take my brain. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I shall catch you next time. Bye for now.